Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, what an honor it is to be here on this important occasion, the launching of this very, very important academic venture. Um, also, what an honor it is for me to follow Professor Stoner. Uh, since we met roughly a decade ago, I think, um, I have, though never formally studied with Professor Stoner, been very much his student um, and learned so much uh, from him, not only about the common law, but also how to be a good scholar. Um, and so it's always a little bit daunting to speak after he does. But he set the table for me very nicely. I'm going to pick up exactly where he left off, talking about continuity amidst change. Um, and I want to suggest off the bat that despite the constant changes around us, some things remain the same. For one, lawyers always have more to say than political scientists. So a point that a political scientist can get across in 300 words or less, a lawyer will debate and then qualify and then caveat and then state exceptions to and then re-examine in at least 25,000 words, not including footnotes. More often than not, by the time the lawyer gets done speaking, we've all forgotten what the original question was, which can be a very effective rhetorical strategy when you're hired to make a bad argument and listening to a lawyer can often cure insomnia. <laughs> Just as constant is that what we lawyers have to say isn't nearly as interesting. Ask a political scientist to speak about the Constitution, and he will respond with big ideas. He'll use terms such as legitimacy, liberty, equal protection, citizenship. Ask a lawyer about the Constitution, and your eyes will slowly glaze over, assuming you can keep them open, as the lawyer barrages you with an avalanche of arcane distinctions, as applied versus facial challenges, rational basis review versus strict scrutiny, retrospective versus retroactive laws, incorporated versus unincorporated rights, etc. Today, I want to try to avoid the eye glazing and the napping by speaking a little more like a political scientist and less like a lawyer. But I hope you'll forgive me if I occasionally lapse into my native tongue. Indeed, I hope to teach you a few phrases of the lawyer's language, because I hope to persuade you that it remains very, very useful, and sometimes even very beautiful, and therefore worth knowing. My thesis is this, that despite the constant changes around us, the laws that are most effective at solving our practical problems remain the same as those that we inherited at the time of the American founding, as you just heard, the concepts, rights, and institutions of the common law. Though we live in an age of relentless moral and technological innovation, as Jeff uh, indicated earlier, we're not very creative at problem making. On the surface, our practical problems may look different from those confronted by Americans 100 or 300 years ago, but they're essentially the same. And though the artifacts of our common law may at first seem dusty, rusty, and obsolete, they remain the best devices available to us to solve the problems that we face today. I'll illustrate my argument by discussing two problems, the problem of data privacy and intellectual property protection. I'll argue that the problems look like new problems, but they really aren't. We see the continuity once we look past the novelty of the technologies in which the problems now most commonly arise. The basic difficulty is one that common lawyers solved centuries ago, namely how to assign legal rights and responsibilities in respect of tangible and intangible assets when those assets come into the possession or under the control of a person other than the person who created them. Common lawyers developed simple, elegant legal devices to solve that recurring problem. And, I'll argue, those devices still work today. The problems look different on the surface because our resources are different and the means of possessing and using them are different. It's just been within the last decade that the total fair market value of intellectual property in the world surpassed the total fair market value of real property in the world. Today, we entrust our most valuable assets, intellectual creations and personal and commercial data, to computer servers and international networks rather than riverboats and ships. But we still face the same challenge of identifying who should have 
access to those resources and who is responsible for delivering them to their rightful users. We address that challenge primarily through a legal doctrine known as trespass, a doctrine that grew out of an ancient common law writ or proceeding. Now today, our trespass disputes concern patented inventions, trademark logos, and digital photographs, but they're still trespass disputes. The property is intangible and movable rather than tangible and fixed, like land, but it's still property. We still need to know whether a defendant entered private property without consent, whether he did so willfully, and whether legal damages will be adequate to compensate the true owner for the infringement. Those are questions as old as the common law, for which the common law has long provided reasonable answers. In fact, our common law is an intellectual storehouse of centuries worth of solutions to recurring practical problems. It's full of concepts, norms, and institutions that we can use today to solve our most pressing practical problems. Open the doors of a common law library, such as the library next to my office at the law school where I teach, and you'll encounter thousands of wonderful conceptual items. Some of them will seem quite peculiar, but some of them may be surprisingly familiar. All of them have been crafted with care by human beings, lawyers acting cooperatively with their clients to solve practical problems in pursuit of legal justice and the common good, and then shaved and sculpted into rational order by judges and legal scholars who identify their rational principles and organize them into intelligible categories. So a common law library is a bit like a museum where all of the artifacts on display can be pulled down off the shelf and used in contemporary life. It's a little bit like um, James Bond's uh, spy museum. Uh, you can still fire up the car and drive it off the lot. And just as marvelous as common law artifacts are used, they become sharper, stronger, and even more effective than when they sat in storage on the shelf. It turns out that the common law is not something that was. The common law is a living legal practice that is. Now, usually when we speak of the practical wisdom of the past, we're talking about the ideas of people now long dead, whose insights may have been impressive achievements in their own day, but which we've largely left behind since. For example, we rightly admire Aristotle for perceiving that the virtues reside within a person and that actions undertaken for good ends not only transit out into the world, but also reside in the acting person, shaping one's character. But we read Aristotle in context, accepting those teachings that have been vindicated and improved by later thinkers and leaving aside his mistaken ideas. For example, thanks to Aristotle, we understand that human beings share an essential nature, but we no longer think that some people are born to be slaves. Aristotle remains largely a product of his time, an impressive specimen to be sure, but largely stuck in ancient Greece. But hold on a moment. Imagine if there were an entire profession devoted to the study of Aristotle and to the practice of the virtues. Imagine if the members of this profession administered virtuous judgment to incontinent clients, for a fee, of course. Imagine if they took on virtue clerks and apprenticed prospective wise people thus passing the inheritance of their profession down from one generation to the next. Imagine further that as the centuries passed and new philosophers came along, they allowed the teachings of St. Paul the Apostle, Augustine, Gregory the Great, Aquinas, C.S. Lewis, and others to refi refine and improve the teachings of Aristotle, all while continuing to practice Aristotle's basic ethic. In that case, Aristotle would no longer be a mere matter of academic interest, a part of history, but would also be the inaugurator of a living tradition and practice, a way of understanding the world to be sure, but also a way of acting and being in the world that enables us to improve the world and to live well in it. In fact, Aristotle inaugurated several such traditions, though not all of those traditions acknowledge their debt to him. The physical sciences would not be possible were human minds not able to discern a rational order in the natural world, as Aristotle taught. Yes, we encounter variety in the world, but not infinite variety. We can discern patterns, even order, if we distinguish, as Aristotle taught us, 
between the essential and the accidental, the central and the peripheral. Despite their apparent dissimilarities, for example, all trees share certain essential characteristics. There is an essence within treeness, and human beings can discover and describe it. The social sciences also owe their authority to Aristotle. There's truth about friendship because there are real friendships. That there are also fake friendships is a reason to criticize fake friendships, not to deny the possibility of truth. Friendship is not a discursive regime established by extroverts to discriminate against introverts. <laughs> the same, I argue, is true of law and civic order. When we look at the world, we can perceive that human beings flourish in well-ordered societies under law, and that human beings remain impoverished and vulnerable when they live under either anarchy or tyranny. The existence of North Korea and Somalia should not cause us to doubt that making and obeying law really is an essential human activity, and that political societies governed by law really are better than, use, than lawless societies in their facility to enable human beings to lead lives of flourishing and fulfillment. A lawful society is thus more fully a human society than a lawless one. Now, Aristotle gave us conceptual tools to understand technology and human innovation as well. He taught us that humans are capable not only of shaping our own character by our actions, but also of shaping the world. He gave us the distinction, later perfected by Aquinas, between the order of doing, in which by acting we shape ourselves, and the order of making, in which by acting we create artifacts that change the world in which we live. We humans generate a dazzling variety of artifacts. We bring into existence new ways of interacting with the world and thereby make the world a different place than it was before we created. As we pursue truth, we create knowledge. As we pursue excellence, we create the professions and guilds and trades and sports leagues. As we pursue beauty, we create music and the visual arts. As we pursue efficiency and leisure, we create industries, technologies, finance, and all the artifacts of prosperity and civilization. And as we pursue justice, we create law. These artifacts reveal our dignity as human beings. In something as simple as the wheel, we can perceive the radical power and potential of a human being. No other creature has ever created anything to transform the world so thoroughly as the wheel. The wheel shrank the continents and it enabled humans to spread across the globe both the blessings and the horrors of empires. When we encounter the wheel afresh with the eyes of Aristotle, we discover in it something that has both utility and moral significance. At the level of making, all wheels are intelligible by their function. Seeing this enables us to see the continuity within human nature. We still make wheels because, like those human beings who made wheels thousands of years ago, we are embodied beings who must find ways to move in a physical world in order to flourish in the world. We're not disembodied experience subjects or pockets of consciousness. At the level of doing, the wheel also teaches us something important about ourselves. We can understand wheels as the result of the agency of beings who are made in the image of the gods, or perhaps of the god, who create and exercise dominion in the present moment as God creates and exercises dominion through all eternity. That humans invented the wheel and that all human beings possess the capacity to understand the wheel is evidence that human beings are awesome creatures indeed. Now turn Aristotle's insights to jurisprudence, the study of law. Aristotle taught us that law can be known by its essential characteristics, just like a tree, a friendship, or a wheel. Law is a real human achievement that exists in the world and can be understood as such. Legal justice is a virtue, or more precisely, one half of the virtue of justice, the other half being natural justice. And law exists in both of the orders that Aristotle identified. Law is something that we do, like friendship, and it is something that we make, like the wheel. We do law and make law in order to achieve justice and order. Order and justice fulfill our nature, help us to flourish. Start with law in the order of making law's artifact. Part of what it means to be a human being is to make laws. You make laws all the time. Every time you drop off a suit at the dry cleaner to have it cleaned, or a watch at the jeweler to have the battery replaced, 
or your car at the mechanic to have it repaired. I guess around here it would be more likely a pickup truck. <laughs> you create something called a bailment. The bailment is an artifact of lawmaking that came down to us from the common law. Now, you have no general obligation to create bailments. Bailments are not general public rules, like criminal laws that prohibit theft and fraud. Nor are they general regulations like traffic laws and building ordinances. You may create bailments or not. Until a practical need for it arises, the bailment sits harmlessly on a shelf in the common law storehouse. But when you need it, it springs into action. All you need to do is to perform the action that causes it to come to life, namely, handing over custody of your personal property to another person. Once you relinquish custody of your suit, your watch, your car, or your laptop computer to a shop owner, the bailment silently and effortlessly governs your relationship with the shop owner until he redelivers the item back to you or delivers it to someone else at your direction. All of the rights and duties needed to resolve any future conflicts between you, the bailor, and your bailee, the shop owner, are settled conclusively at the moment you hand your item to the bailee, according to long settled customary rules of the common law. For example, your bailee now has the right to exclude third parties from the item. If a bad actor takes your watch or laptop out of the repair shop, your bailee has a cause of action for replevin, the common law action that enables a person to recover personal property. When you handed the tangible item to the bailee, you also handed over an intangible, but very real, legal right, a right known as a power. You didn't see the power. You probably didn't even think about it. But thanks to the bailment, the power moved from you to the shop owner just as surely as the tangible item did. And your bailey now has the power to recover possession of the watch or laptop from a third party wrongdoer. Furthermore, the common law gives your bailey a strong motivation to exercise this power, to recover the watch or laptop from any wrongdoer, because the bailment imposes on your bailey a duty to re-deliver the item to you at the end of the bailment. So the bailment both empowers you, the bailee, and makes the bailee responsible. You didn't need to, trans to negotiate for this transfer of responsibility. It happened automatically because the common law deems your relationship with the shop owner to be a bailment. The common law right, not the tangible thing, is what solves all of those practical problems in advance. The property right is not the suit, the watch, or the laptop computer. Thus, it does not matter what the thing is, nor even that the thing is tangible. The bailment can perform this elegant work for data and intellectual creations just as easily and just as elegantly as it does for suits and watches. The old common law bailment, therefore, pro provides a simple solution to one of the most pressing problems of our day, namely, how to define the rights and duties of persons with respect to data that are entrusted to computer systems and networks. The bailment solves that problem in a way that vindicates the just expectations of all concerned. When you deliver custody of your pictures, emails, and essays to a server or internet service provider, you are creating a bailment with respect to personal property that belongs to you. Unless you expressly agree to the contrary, the service provider is the bailee of your property and has both the legal power and the responsibility to deliver possession of your data according to your directions. Now, as Professor Stoner just demonstrated, American constitutions are built from these common law materials. For example, wherever the Constitution of the United States mentions property, it means the common law rights of property. Unfortunately, the US Supreme Court has not always remembered this fact. As a result, much of the court's recent jurisprudence is conceptually confused. Some of it is quite lawless. Consider the Fourth Amendment, which secures the, quote, right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures by the police and other officials of government. Now, under the Supreme Court's so-called third party doctrine, you are deemed to have waived your Fourth Amendment property rights when you hand over your personal property to another private party. It follows that a government officer may access your personal data without your consent and without a warrant and without probable cause, if a reviewing court finds either that you had no expectation of privacy in the data or that you did have an expectation of privacy 
but that your expectation was, in the court's estimation, not reasonable. Now, most people have the intuition that this rule is wrong, and most people are right. <laughs> the court is messed up by ignoring the simple and elegant ways in which common law property artifacts, such as bailments, determine the rights and duties of persons with respect to personal property, including intangible property. Justice Gorsuch pointed this out in dissent in the 2018 case Carpenter versus the United States, and I'm going to go through some passages from his dissent because I think they're really instructive. Under the court's reasonable expectation of privacy test, Justice Gorsuch wondered rhetorically, quote, what's left of the Fourth Amendment? Today, we use the internet to do most everything. Smartphones make it easy to keep a calendar, correspond with friends, make calls, conduct banking, and even watch the game. Countless internet companies maintain records about us and increasingly for us. Even our most private documents, those that in other eras we would have locked safely in a desk drawer or destroyed, now reside on third party servers. Our precedents teach that the police can review all of this material on the theory that no one reasonably expects any of it will be kept private. But no one believes that if they ever did. Echoing law professor Oren Kerr, Justice Gorsuch concluded that the third party doctrine is not only wrong, but quote, horribly wrong. The court has never offered a persuasive justification for the doctrine, Gorsuch offered, but he has offered there is another way. From the founding until the 1960s, the right to assert a Fourth Amendment claim didn't depend on your ability to appeal to a judge's personal sensibilities about the reasonableness of your expectations of privacy. It was tied to the law. The law is the common law of property. Gorsuch continues, the Fourth Amendment protects the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. True to those words and their original understanding, the traditional approach asked if a house, paper, or effect was yours under law. No more was needed to trigger the Fourth Amendment. The specific property law artifact that solves this recurring problem is our old friend, the bailment. Justice Korzach asked his colleagues, quote, ever hand a private document to a friend to be returned? Toss your keys to a valet at a restaurant? Ask your neighbor to look after your dog while you travel? You would not expect the friend to share the document with others, the valet to lend your car to his buddy, or the neighbor to put Fido up for adoption. Justice Gorsuch reminded his colleagues why their expectations would be vindicated in these cases. Entrusting your stuff to others is a bailment. Under well-settled common law doctrine, a bailee who uses the item in a different way than he's supposed to, or against the bailor's instructions, is liable for conversion. Turn now to law in the order of doing, the moral aspect of law. By making laws in certain shapes and not others, we constitute ourselves as a certain kind of people. By participating in the common law, we become a common law sort of people. Common law people think and act differently than people who live under civil law or central planning authorities. Consider again the bailment. Other legal orders have different devices for solving coordination problems concerning personal property. The bailment is our solution, the one that we made, and the one that we renew with continual use. It is one way in which people who live under the common law govern ourselves, make law for ourselves. As the great English jurist William Blackstone said of customary common law generally, it, quote, carries this internal evidence of freedom along with it, that it probably was introduced by the voluntary consent of the people. Blackstone quoted the Roman jurist Julianus, saying, quote, since the written law binds us for no other reason but because it is approved by the judgment of the people, therefore those laws which the people have approved without writing ought also to bind everybody. After the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of the empire, Blackstone observed, the Roman and civil law tradition lost much of its veneration for custom and self-governance. But the common law preserved its ancient customs. This, Blackstone thought, is one way in which the common law of England and her colonies is morally superior to the civil law of Rome and the European continent. Now, Blackstone was a common law partisan. In some respects, he overstated the differences between common law and civil law. 
They have a lot more in common than he gave them credit. But he was on to something. Like Justice Gorsuch dissenting in Carpenter, Blackstone would remind our Supreme Court that by creating and using our own legal artifacts, the people decide for ourselves which expectations of privacy and exclusiveness are reasonable and entitled to vindication in court. Unlike civil law, common law is not handed down to us from on high. Common law is different from other kinds of legal order in this respect and others. And we should not be surprised to find variety amongst legal orders, just as we find varieties amongst the sports, music, and clothing of different societies. Different societies make laws differently according to the conditions in which they find themselves, their juristic resources available to them, and the problems they're trying to solve. Of course, human beings make laws according to certain in universal patterns or first principles. As Professor Stoner indicated, the common law can never be contrary to natural and divine law. Every functioning society must have laws prohibiting murder and theft, for example. But the specific form and content of our laws are contingent on our choices and actions. Legal artifacts are made for purposes. Once made, successful legal artifacts tend to be used again to solve similar problems. Why reinvent the wheel? As long as the legal device is reasonable, that is, as long as it works effectively to solve a recurring problem and is not unjust toward any of the participants in the relevant transaction, it will be pressed into service wherever it can be useful. We know when to press it into service when our purposes align with the purposes of those who used it before. Over time, the contours of the legal artifact come clearly into view as the artifact is tested in cases and controversies. Judges in the common law tradition resolve questions about the rights and duties that the legal artifact entails within the context of particular disputes between particular persons. So they take into consideration the actions and reasoning of the parties. At the same time, they must render judgment in such a way that the law is a coherent whole, such that the rights and duties of the parties are understood to be vested according to law rather than caprice or happenstance. So judges always begin with the settled logic of the legal artifact that the parties themselves used. As a result, the laws that we make are intelligible as real things, though they are as intangible and abstract as the concept of the wheel. We can study laws and understand their rationality. And by doing so, we can perceive what kind of people these people have made themselves, us, by making and using these particular laws in these particular ways. I'll close by illustrating this last point with another contemporary controversy, a recent disagreement about the nature of patent rights. The patent is a legal innovation of the civil law that came into the common law of England and then was transformed into Amer in America into something uniquely American. The first patents were granted to inventors in what is now Italy, in the republics of Venice and Florence in the 15th century. Later, the English crown began to issue letters patent to both inventors and anyone else who could bring a new industry or technology into the kingdom. English patents were not property rights. They were concessions of privilege from the sovereign. They entailed the legal obligation to practice the covered innovation or technology. Now, the American founders kept the patent, but they adapted it to an American understanding of intellectual property rights as natural and prepositive. Like all natural rights, intellectual property rights pre-exist positive law, but sometimes they require positive enactments, written constitutions and statutes, to give them specific form and to secure them against wrongful deprivation. The American conception of patents as natural and prepositive is why the intellectual property clause of Article I of the Constitution of the United States refers to rights rather than privileges and why it authorizes Congress to secure those rights, not to create them. Indeed, the intellectual property clause is the only place where the original Constitution, prior to the Bill of Rights, uses the word right. Commenting on this clause in Federalist 43, James Madison observed that copyrights and exclusive rights and inventions are rights at common law. An inventor or author has a common law right to keep her creation to herself. She can practice her invention as a trade secret. She can share her writings and correspondence privately with her family and friends. 
And she can expect a court to give her a remedy if some person wrongfully appropriates her intellectual creations. Now, exercising the power conferred upon it in the Intellectual Property Clause, Congress right away enacted patent and copyright laws, offering to inventors and authors a quid pro quo exchange. The public gives to the inventor or author an exclusive right for a limited time, and the inventor or author gives to the public a disclosure of the intellectual creation. Because the patent and copyright are offered in exchange for pre-existing common law rights, patents and copyrights must be the property of the creator, who was induced to yield up his property rights by disclosing his creation. The law, then, must provide at least as much legal security for patents and statutory copyrights as it does for trade secrets and common law copyrights, not only for the pragmatic purpose of inducing disclosure, but also as a matter of legal justice. American patent law gave particular form to this conception of patents as property rights in several ways. First, American patents vested at the time of invention, not at the time of filing or issue, as patents do in Europe. Thus, American patents belonged as a matter of right to the first inventor, whose inventive efforts first brought the new innovation into existence. In American law, patent infringement and the validity of patents are adjudicated by courts and juries, like other property rights. Patents can also be licensed, mortgaged, co-owned, just like other property estates. And because patents are property, a patentee whose rights are infringed or appropriated is entitled to the legal remedies of a property owner, and equitable remedies as well. Just compensation, if the government takes the patent by eminent domain, an injunction or damages if a private person infringes the patent. As Abraham Lincoln observed in his famous Fire of Invention speech, the American conception of patents as property rights helped make young America far more innovative, productive, and prosperous than when he called old fogey Europe. Europe was burdened by her trade guilds, stationers' companies, and other monopoly powers designed to prevent the most powerful ideas from getting out into the world, where they might do good things for people. By contrast, American patent law, quote, added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. Commenting on Lincoln's now famous metaphor, Michael Novak observed that Lincoln saw in the patent laws an unprecedented blessing. American patent law helped to constitute the American people morally, shaping our character as a people. The American patent ignited human energies in productive directions. By contrast, Novak explained, a regime that does not secure natural rights depresses human energy. Natural rights, he continues, are not mere legal puffs of air. They formalize capacities for action that in some societies lie dormant and in others are fueled into ignition. The United States, Lincoln believed, lit a fi fire to the practical genius of its people among the highborn and the lowborn alike. In fact, the American patent turned the United States into the world's research and development laboratory. From the time of the American founding until just a decade ago, this peculiarly American version of an old common law artifact motivated most of the world's great innovations. But then, in 2011, Congress passed and President Obama signed into the inaptly named America Invents Act. The act reconceived of patents as a franchise privilege as they had been under English law. This radical reconfiguration of the American patent has a number of technical legal implications, which I won't go through in detail. But one of the most significant is to award patent rights to the first person to file rather than the first to invent. This is an express rejection of the American conception in favor of the European conception. This change, of course, uh, shifts the benefits of invention from hardworking, gritty innovators to large corporations, which have teams of lawyers ready to race to the patent and trademark office as soon as they learn of a new technological innovation. Another change is that any person may now challenge the validity of a patent without going to court by filing an administrative proceeding in a federal administrative agency. 
and a patent owner may be subjected to many such administrative proceedings so that no determination of validity is ever final. As a result, patent rights are now much less secure than they were a decade ago, and the powers of the administrative state loom per perpetually over innovators and their investors. Now, the inevitable constitutional challenge to the American Invents Act reached the Supreme Court in the court's 2017 term in the case Oil States Energy Services versus Green's Energy Group. Justice Thomas, writing for the court, and Justice Gorsuch, writing in dissent, devoted most of their opinions to discussions of the common law. They considered the respective jurisdictions of various English courts and councils in the medieval and modern periods, the differences between private common law rights and public franchises, the declaratory and remedial functions of legislation, and foundational common law jurisprudential concepts such as the social contract and consideration. Ultimately, they disagreed about how to interpret those legal concepts, but they did agree that the patent is a common law institution, and its legal and constitutional status can only be understood by examining it in light of the legal tradition from which it emerged. The patent can be understood as English, or it can be understood as American, but it must be one or the other. Bailments, patents, and other property rights are just some of the artifacts of our legal tradition that remain useful, even vital. The common law sits at hand, waiting to be pulled down off the shelf and used to solve our practical problems. But someone has to maintain the knowledge of the common law so that we'll remember when and how to use it. That's why institutions such as New St. Andrews are important. The Hale Institute is an inspired innovation. I'm confident that under Jeff Schaefer's leadership, the center will do more to preserve and cultivate knowledge of our common law than many law schools will. So thank you for undertaking this important effort, and thank you for allowing me to help you inaugurate it. <laughs>